Good afternoon. My name is Hamburner, and it's my distinct pleasure to introduce to you Diane Donai as this year's recipient of the Arne Motulski Barton Childs Award for Excellence in Human Genetics Education. Diane Donai studied medicine in London in the United Kingdom and as a young mother obtained a part-time position in clinical genetics at Manchester University. She has remained at Manchester throughout her career where she is now a professor of genomic medicine and the clinical director of St Mary's Hospital. Diane has played myriad roles in educating genetics professionals and the public. In my four introductory minutes, I intend to mention her workshops, a master's program, a book, a centre for public engagement, a conference, a course and a role in the European School of Genomic Medicine. So when I say myriad, I mean just that. A key element in her approach to all this teaching is to recognize the patient as a person and to try to understand not just the disease and its genetics, but also the impact all of this has on people's lives, including their wider family. So why does Diane and I merit this award? Diane is known to practically every clinical geneticist in the world for her inspiring dysmorphology workshops that she and Robin Winter initiated at the European Society of Human Genetics meeting almost 20 years ago. These meetings are a masterclass in clinical decision-making and rational thinking. Those coming on stage to share a patient's phenotype and story feel respected and elevated and give their best. All 500 or so attendees come away filled with energy and the resolve to do better as clinical professionals. In addition, Diane travels the world to moderate sm similar but smaller scale workshops in many countries, including in Scandinavia and North America. In 1993, Diane founded the first master's program in genetic counselling in Europe, together with Lauren Kurz and Storar, a program which still runs today. With Andrew Reid, Diane has co-authored an influential book entitled New Clinical Genetics, a teaching resource currently in its third edition. Diane initiated plans for the Manchester Nowgen Centre and acquired the almost £4 million from the British government necessary for its inception and building. Diane led the Nowgen Centre for several years as a centre of excellence in public engagement, education and professional training in biomedicine. In 1984, Diane started the three-day Manchester Dysmorphology Meeting, bringing together medical geneticists from all over Europe, Australia and the USA. The emphasis of this meeting is on understanding pathogenesis and mechanisms. After 30 years, this meeting continues to shape the way in which the medical genetics community approaches modern dysmorphology and developmental disorders. It is not surprising, then, that at one festive evening, participants sang her praise as the Dismo Queen to the tune of the well-known Abba song. Diane, together with her colleagues, organizes the Manchester Dysmorphology course aimed at young professionals entering clinical genetics. And the 2017 course had 40 delegates from 21 countries from all over the globe. Diane teaches on the faculty of the European School of Genomic Medicine, and she talks on the first day about the life of her patients, Penny and Arthur, Ar Arthur Dean, a couple with achondroplasia, with whom she's had a long professional association. Her lectures stay with our young professionals for the rest of their careers. All in all, Diane is an exceptionally inspiring role model. Few in the field have done so much to encourage combining proper clinical thinking with compassionate genetic counselling in generations of young medical and clinical geneticists. It is for these reasons that Diane Donai is a worthy recipient of the Arne Motulski Barton Childs Award for Excellence in Human Genetics Education. Please welcome Diane Donai. Are you here? Are you here? Okay, take that down. 
Oh, sorry. Thank you very much. Now I can see you. Well, thank you very much, Han, for those really kind words, and thank you very much to the American Society for this great honour. Um, I realise that I met Arno Matulski and Barton Childs um, in 1998 at a meeting in London to celebrate Lionel Penrose's centenary of his birth. And both of them published their thoughts on what um, Penrose had meant to them. And that brought back to me my time as a young paediatric resident in London in 1971 after Penrose had retired, but after he'd started the Kennedy Center, um, which was funded, as you might imagine, by the Kennedy Foundation, but was to look at individuals with intellectual disability in a more scientific way. And I invited him, to sit, because he worked nearby, to see the patient you see in the top right of the slide. This patient had rubinstein tabi syndrome about much wasn't really known at the time. Lionel Penrose came along with Renata Laxova. And Renata Laxova, who, as you know, had a distinguished career in the United States, had just fled Prague for the second time in her life after the Soviet invasion. And Penrose, because of his values, gave her both a home and a job. I watched these two examine my patient. I watched them talking to her, and I watched them talking to their family. They took fingerprints, they examined little parts of her, and it was a real learning experience for me. And I remember thinking, wouldn't it be great if you could do that as a career? But of course, there was no such career of clinical genetics in the UK. It wasn't a spe specialty. But in 1977, after we'd moved to Manchester, I saw an advert which was for part-time married woman required for clinical assistant sessions in genetics. So I was well qualified for this, having been married, and so I applied for it. I started my own observations and realized that patients are by far the best teachers and that it's our duty as doctors to delineate what we see in our patients and interpret for them and for the rest of the profession. This little boy, Sam, I saw and realized he had um, a pattern of um, complex abnormalities that didn't fit any syndrome that I knew of. His mother had a, a fetus affected after this, and I sought other patients with this, and my colleague um, Margaret Barrow presented one at our meeting in London, and so we wrote up this new autosomal recessive disorder. It was 15 years before we were able to determine the cause of this abnormality, which turned out in a collaboration that we had with Harvard to be mutations in a gene called LRP2. There was a mouse model of this, and that mouse model had proteinuria. So we tested all our patients, and they too had proteinuria, which wasn't known before the discovery of the gene. And sadly, Sam died last year of renal failure, but after a, a fulfilling life. He was very proud to be the first patient with this disorder described. Patients can sometimes set you on a course of investigation, and this patient I show you here, who's got the most peculiar feet, which reminded me of the feet of a triploid fetus I'd seen, and she was shown to be a diploid triploid mosaic. This disorder had been um, confused with incontinentia pigmenti previously, and so I set about investigating um, 100 families with IP, collaborating with Sue Kenrick on the mapping studies, and then later with Arnold Munich's group and David Nelson's group to identify the gene. I'd always been interested in other mosaic disorders, and these are some of my patients whose samples have been contributed towards international efforts to find um, the underlying mutation. Patient stories are very powerful teaching tools, as Han mentioned. My colleague, Andrew Reid, who I've worked with for 40 years in Manchester, we devised this novel way of teaching medical students by using family stories. 
and the whole of the genetics curriculum is presented to students through the stories of 26, albeit fictional um, families, but based uh, a great deal on my experience. But of course, as Corey said, dis nobody is an island, and dysmorphology must be international because the rare diseases we see are very rare. And I've been privileged to visit, to collaborate with, to tell my stories and to hear stories from all of these countries that have radiate out from this Manchester-centric map. But dysmorphology, like the rest of genetics, is changing. It's becoming more the norm to do investigations first before detailed physical studies. And in the many studies, such as I quote here the DDD study and the 100,000 Genome Project, deep phenotyping is absolutely essential for the interpretation of variants. Also, dysmorphologists have to get smarter and they have to have precision and consistency in their phenotypic descriptions. And this is through, in, this is why um, initiatives such as human phenotype ontology are so important. But everything has to come back to the patient. And this is why the European Reference Network have been established for rare diseases to develop management and treatment guidelines, etc. Dysmorphology is also changing um, by its use of imaging. Peter Hammond from London was an early pioneer in this field, and you can see him there with his 3D cameras um, developing dense surface models. And with collaboration with dysmorphologists from all over the world, he developed these composite models of um, many of the more common syndromes. Um, and these were very useful and continue to be useful in research. When we were involved with our studies on Williams syndrome, the Williams syndrome critical region, there were a number of individuals we saw who had atypical deletions. The little girl you see here has a deletion that's big but smaller than the, um, the average um, uh, Williams syndrome deletion. You can see her deletion outlined in red on the slide and she's not deleted for some of the telomeric genes. We needed a way to analyze her facial features accurately, and we were able to do that using the models and showed that she didn't either fit with the Williams um, patient's average or the control population average. And this indicated strongly that the genes in the telomeric end of the Williams critical region were important for the characteristic facial appearance. But that was technology that wasn't very useful in the clinic. But obviously, technology's moved on, and organizations such as FDNA, who have the face to gene suite, have produced um, a technology that's useful in the clinic. And so, with a smartphone, it's now possible to compare your patient with composite photographs from individuals with a syndrome that you suspect, or even it may suggest syndromes to you that you haven't thought about. So in drawing to an end my talk, I thought what I would do is use this technology, but also acknowledge men, many of my colleagues, mentors, and students, some from uh, North America, many from the UK and Europe, we're still the same. Um, and what I really want to do is I've divided them in a rather sexist way into females and into my males. My first attachment was uh, in Charlie Epstein's department where Brian Hall was working at the time, but those are many other people I've been privileged to collaborate with. So I thought I'd see whether there was a common phenotype for dysmorphologists and what we came up with was this. And in the, top in the top left, there's my photograph compared to my female 
colleagues and mentors. And you can see there's pretty good correlation um, in this. I'm also delighted to see that there's much less um, similarity between my phenotype and my male mentors. So finally, um, I'd like to thank the people to whom I am genetically related, that is my family, my two children on the right, Tom and Melissa, and my grandchildren there, and my husband Paul on the left, who gave me the qualification to get into genetics, that is, he married me. <laughs> and I'd like to thank my colleagues in the Manchester Centre for Genomic Medicine. It's a big comprehensive centre and we've kept all of genetics together because we feel that's the best way to serve our patients. And here are some of the patients I will never forget, including Penny and Arthur, who Han mentioned, um, who are receiving their OBE from Prince Charles and the next generation of the Dean family you see next to them. So thank you very much for this award and thank you for allowing me to acknowledge that patients are indeed the best teachers.